Um, oh, got see. it. <laughs> My computer was on mute. Maybe that's. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Oh, Thanks. perfect, perfect. All right. What's going on? Tell me stuff. How's New York? Um, you know, it's crazy. Um, I we've been here since March. I mean, I've lived here my whole life, but we've been riding at the pandemic here, and um, it's not the same, of course, nor would it be. But um, it's a little depressing. A lot of stores have closed, and, and restaurants closed, and stuff. And a lot of people just left, so it's definitely less less busy. Um, and somewhere that's always seemed like a great place to live, suddenly when it's dangerous to be near other people, it's like not great. Um, but other than that, I'm I'm fine, I guess, healthy. Did you uh, did you go to the you grew up in Manhattan? Yes. Did, did you, uh, you didn't go to the Little Red Schoolhouse, did you, for school? No, but I know where that is. I've yeah, passed I by it. No, I, I just, I have friends who went there as, as youngsters, and uh, okay. I find it amusing that their parents were these would-be communists, or they caught the last, <laughs> they caught the last gasp of um, Jewish subversiveness, you know, in, in intellectualism. <laughs> right. Interesting, <laughs> but, yeah. But no, but it's 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 hard. No, but I, I went to Ithaca College my freshman year. Oh, great! And then I went to University of Wisconsin, which had even more New Yorkers. And yeah. so I had, I had friends who went to like, you know, Sp Spence and York Prep and oh, Bronx my. Science and yeah, yeah. all these places. But you know, I my my a friend of mine went to Trinity. Okay, which I was uh, which no one really knows below a certain age that Jim Carroll went there. Oh. And, and he, you know, the poet from the Basketball Diaries, and he was a basketball star. Cool. So, so I was, I was kind of panicking for like a half hour, like, what am I going to ask? Because, you know, <laughs> talking to an author who interviews other people is, um, is, it's just another ball of wax. But, you know, at, at first I thought, wow, uh, why America? And then I said, well, why the hell not? And then this is <laughs> not in the, this was not an obscure band. Right. Exactly. They are and were and aren't mainstream enough where they, they had many hits, of course, but they definitely touched a lot of different people, right? There weren't like this niche um, underground band at all. They were on top. Um, so like you said, why the hell not? Um, I can talk a bit more about that personally or why I particularly wanted to write about them. Um, I, I'd actually been coming out of grad school, this was a couple years ago, and I had written my thesis on Bruce Springsteen and the Narcus on the Edge of Town album, which is one of my favorite 70s records. You got, um, you're my new best friend. Yeah, I'm good. Honestly, I don't know, this, I'm, I'm manifesting your friendship only because who meets somebody? <laughs> I, anyway, continue, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, um, I'd love that, that's great, Bruce is the best. Um, but I was looking for something to write a longer form piece, um, a book about someone in the rock field who, who deserved a book and who hadn't been overly written about yet. And that's when I got to interview Jerry Beckley for um, his solo album, which came out in 2016, the Carousel album for this magazine I write for, The Vinyl District. And we had such a great conversation. And I, as I was doing my own research for that interview, I realized, oh, there's not a book about them other than Dan Peake's uh, memoirs which are great but there wasn't you know this biography of their 50-year career so that's when I really started to delve into what that book could could be um, and I got obsessed with them from a fan's perspective a music fan's perspective also. I know isn't it great it's there yeah. uh I remember getting chills you know when you're young and some kind some notes or so, it could be in a old BG song or it could be in you know I, I even heard a song by uh Who's that awesome um, Shakira? And it, it just just blew my socks off. You know, I was watching my little girl in in a performance one summer a few years ago. But uh, um, this is for all the lonely people. There's this a really really cool uh, before like this descending thing before the um, the harmonica kicks in, and it's just so sweet. And one second, my daughter is giving me a note. One second. Grandma is coming in 10 minutes to take me for a walk. Yes. She can't come up, though, because I'm doing this right now. All right, so <laughs> get your hats and gloves on and then just wait. You want to say hi to my uh, my new friend? This is this is Sadie, my daughter. Hi, hi sweetie. Hi. She's going to be just like you someday. She's going to grow up and be a writer. 
Well, that's great. That's either that or the circus. You know, I, yeah, I, I wanted to be a clown when I was younger. That was my first dream job. So. I'm the dad that's going to say, what's wrong with the GED? You're 16 already. Why don't you go <laughs> join Ringling Brothers? Right. That's, that's the whole plan. So um, what was that moment that you, that sort of uh, engendered you to being their, their biggest fangirl about, uh, below <laughs> a certain age? Like, I know what it's like to get obsessed with some group, um, but it doesn't happen so much anymore. Yes, I tend to like music that came out before I was born. Um, and I was thinking about this earlier that I think part of the reason for that, other than the basic response that I have that I happen to like it like so many other people do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's something to, when there's a finished item that that has already existed in history for a certain period that I feel better able to understand it and understand the cultural implications around it. Um, so I do that a lot, or I have done that a lot where I get into this one band and their whole catalog for a while. Um, and I have done that over the years. Um, why America is interesting when I really started to get into their deep cuts because I was familiar with their greatest hits, of course, which mm -hmm. are these great classic songs that you hear on the radio even today. Um, but how I was so impressed with how well crafted the albums were. Um, and I thought that that was a bit under reflected upon, underwritten about um, in terms of th these deep cuts on albums like Hat Trick from uh, their third album, which is one probably my favorite of theirs. Um, but it's a, it's a very complex record and it kind of reminded me of a, a Beatles record too, with all the different elements that they have going on there. and and just feeling the need to express and articulate how they're so much more than just their greatest hits and mm -hmm. how they have lasted for so long and that they're still together. It's amazing. It's, you know, you mentioned the Beatles. I mean, these guys literally grew up as Americans in the shadow of, uh, well, they were already in Great Britain. And it's just, it's, they, they definitely were little kids when the Beatles came around, like in 64, but right. they, this is, you know, when the psychedelic thing is happening, they're joining bands, they meet each other, you know, and which I, I'm totally fascinated by that because um, that must have been just such a, a fertile ground for anybody with talents that appreciated good pop music and harmonies, yet, you know, had this American thing that the British kids didn't have. I think that when I, when I first read about America, it was in one of those rock encyclopedia encyclopedia books, and I would just read about them. And they were like, "Wow, they were army and air force brats, and and they got to grow up abroad. This is this is a cool bunch of guys, and then they look good too, you know." Yeah, you know. So it's it's. But when you do, when you listen to records, like you just explained, like that everything you 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 sort of glean, you know, where it is content. You know, contextually like in history you know like right. if you're listening to Je Jackson Brown's first record you're probably thinking of okay uh you're thinking of David Geffen the Asylum Records and all yeah. these really interesting people in Laurel Canyon is that what what appealed to you with um when you first heard America like what what was it just a recording thing was it like some kind of weird cultural touchstone that you wanted to hit on um it's interesting to think about. I think it was kind of a combination of, of all of those things. Um, overall, I would say it, it was just their their oral aesthetic that they had going on, which does remind me and a lot of people of, of just that time in the 1970s in California, that acoustic um, warm kind of sound, the blended harmonies that are reminiscent of the CSN and CSNY records. Um, and just responding to that basic sound and, and liking it, um, and then I think what I believed there, when I really started to consider um, who they were as people and do research and, and stuff, um, I thought about how, what their character was, what their, um, their career character was in the, in the lens or viewing it through the, the lens of music history and mm -hmm. what they contributed. And um, I started to understand more that they were um, a logo band more like uh, the Steve Miller Band was in the 70s and, and Chicago was at that time too. Um, and these big successful pop rock acts sold so many records. 
um, but they were a bit, the, the individual band members were kind of hidden behind the logo in a way where people, so many people were more familiar with their logo and the songs, but not them as, as people. There weren't as many wild tales about them. Um, they didn't have these elaborate, over-the-top characters necessarily, at least in um, comparison to some other famous wild rockers. Right. So they were a bit set, set apart that way, which, which I found, I, I just felt that there was more than, met, than meets the eye that way in terms of the depth of the music that was there too. And it was, there was a lot of depth. I mean, I think even more so if you listen to, I think the wordplay is so much better than, I hate to say the Eagles, you know, which were just, <laughs> you know, they, I'm not going to slag the Eagles, you know, because they're great. You know, I, I always like the Bernie Ledin years though, because I love the Burrito Brothers and all that yeah. stuff. But with, um, with America, they're not infamous. You know, that's why I was thinking, you know, I once heard a quote um, by one of Buddy Holly's contemporaries, and, and this is in one of those 25 years after the, the plane crash and everything. He says, I don't know what you could say about Buddy other than he was just a nice guy. Like there was nothing there, but it's like there is, if you dig deeper and you, and you figure out what's driving them artistically. And so you get, who do, do you have to sell anybody on this, on, on you being the, the caretaker of their legacy, you know, in written form, like how in approaching them, tell me about how all that came about. Sure, uh, that was such an interesting experience for me, especially as a younger writer. Um, they, well, my first interview with Jerry for that, that one album um, just went so well and we, we had a very good um, conversational flow and he, he and Dewey, as I later got to know, were very articulate in terms of how they, I found them to be how they express their memories and how they articulate artistic ideas and they're they they seemed more intellectual than, than some other musicians even might be um and then when i really began to put a book proposal together um they were receptive um once they i mean it did take their management um had some discussions with my literary agent and that was a you know books can take a long time in that in that way or projects that involve different parties so that took about a year probably um but when i got to speak to the band members individu individually about that later um and even they'll say it now too that they were very responsive to my proposal and and the concept that i was presenting the book as which as as you've um seen by reading it yourself um it's really based around the albums the story is told through the, the records and there isn't that much about their personal lives in there and there's a lot of song analysis which is right i'm i feel fortunate that they were receptive to that part of it because that's what i like to do as a writer and they could have said you know no because some of it is a bit more just uh personal or from my perspective I mean it's not necessarily factual in terms of the analysis part but but it they were very receptive to it and like we were on the same page which worked well why did you choose that angle um I just love that way of writing I think one of my favorite rock books is uh Grail Marcus's Mystery Train oh, yeah. um and he does a lot of that in terms of riffing off of what an artist or, or their work suggests and then he kind of takes it somewhere and relates it to different parts of American history and culture um, and some of it can be seem a bit out there too and you might not even a reader might not agree with it in totality but you'll you'll pick up certain ideas that that you like and I could see someone totally disagreeing with a certain opinion there um, but I just like that way of writing and I think as a writer I'm more um, poetic and kind of flowery I like a lot of words yeah. um, rather than just simple sentences well, so I, he's a great, he's a great person to look to for influence. I mean, he's, uh, uh, it's, it's almost like a, an American painter, you know, the, yes, way he, yeah. it, the way he describes it. It's so elevated. It's like high opera, but it could be about <laughs> a guy who worked the bathroom, you know, <laughs> you know, in the, in the so-called colored section of, you know, East St. Louis, you know, he'll like find some kind of, he'll bring in like Greek mythology or something like that. Right. One, one time I met um, William Bell, who's still alive. He's a Stax Records guy. He's, um, he's just fantastic. And I said, yeah, I'm a big fan of those Peter Garolnik books. And he just said, Peter, oh man, fuck. <laughs> that guy's deep. That guy goes deep. Like, it's just, wow. it's so, and when I read your book, um, I was like, I like this because it's, I like granular things, you know, I like, 
it, it's just it's it's new perspectives are are fantastic, and and then and then I started what what I really enjoyed was like, wow, why hadn't this book been written before? Why did it take, you know, you? <laughs> You know, it took a while, you know, but that's, that's also a lesson. People need to be patient. You know, the author's not born yet. You right. know? The author's in second yeah. grade. Right. <laughs> but, but I know, I, and that's what I, I really did love about your writing. But that I want to know about you, though. Tell me where, you know, I, I know that you credit your mom and dad as, um, as being um, very deeply influential on, on you. Um, so it, Tell me about you. Tell me about your family. Um, well, I am and was, you know, always an only child and pretty close with my parents, and I, I still am. Um, so I always felt like I was treated like an equal player. Um, I remember that feeling being younger, uh, which was great. And they are huge music fans, rock music fans, and and that I like to think of them as more than fans. You know, they happen to be artists them themselves. Right. My dad is a visual artist. My mom is a singer. Um, and song songwriter too, um, cool. and it was just always treated as very important growing up. That's the my earliest memories. You know, watching my dad like alphabetize the, our massive record collection, um, and just playing certain songs. And they would always tell me certain facts about the songs that they knew. Um, and I just feel like I acquired a lot of knowledge that way. Um, give me, give me an example. I know I know what that means, but I'd, I'd be curious to know what songs. The facts. Yeah. Um, Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, I think like a lot of uh, people's, especially younger people's um, musical education, a lot of it is based around the Beatles catalog and or just it seemed to start there and then venture out. Um, so I remember like one summer, my dad and I watched the um, the anthology documentary series. I don't think it's available anymore on DVD. I, I was just looking, looking at this like last week. I keep looking for it. It's, uh, it's so good. Isn't it? I love it. My only great, problem, yeah. they should have interviewed Pete Best for it. I, I just think that if you're talking about these, he would have done it and smiled and it would have been a nice thing. Sorry to digress. So you're yeah. watching the anthology. Yeah. Um, like we would uh, devote a lot of, like, like one summer, I feel like we spent not just watching that series, but, but watching it. And then I learned more about the, the Beatles that way and, and their, music, their records, it felt very concentrated, like one one band at a time kind yeah. of thing. And we did that with the Kinks another summer. I remember like we listened to all their records. Um, and I think because they love the music so much, they enjoyed, you know, kind of teaching me about it. Um, and they have teacher personalities, which, which make for good parents anyway, but um, it helped in that way in terms of receiving knowledge. And I, I was always interested in it. So if you have a receptive student, it, it works well. If you have a receptive kid, you yeah. know. Right. That must have that must have given them such to use a nice Jewish word nachas, you know. <laughs> must have made them feel so so cool, you know. I feel like that with yeah. my kid. She's an only child, you know. And uh, what what uh, were you listening to? Did you did you have like your own music uh, preferences to them? It must have been very lonely because not lonely <laughs> because amongst your friends. I doubt they were like trying to figure out, you know, if Warner Brothers, you know, was the yeah, most record. Same us. here. Um, well, I did manage. I think like souls attracted to the same types of art, or you know, you'll find each other somehow. So I do remember like meeting um, kids throughout when I got a bit older, probably more like middle, middle school, high school, college age, that liked rock music too, and we would talk about different records and and um, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I don't know if I would use the word lonely, but it was always very, um, solo, but, but listening sure. to music and studying records as, as you might feel too, is, is like a solo activity, at least in that first intro to certain bands and albums, like you have to do it alone, um, or just to really get the whole experience and, and the lyrics that I've always been a big lyrics person. So I like really? to really know exactly what they are and, and analyze songs. What not you way. out? Um, like, were there any songs that just knocked knocked you out completely? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there, I like to think about having this consistent top 10 songs. I don't know if you do, if you're a list maker, but <laughs> a lot of music people. No, but I just watched Hi High Fidelity. High Fidelity, the top which, five. Yeah, yeah and that, <laughs> uh, 
I mean, they filmed that in my neighborhood while I was in a band in Wicker Park. Oh, cool. I mean, I would walk by there. I saw them yeah. filming it, but that's what resonates with me. Book is better, you know? But it's, I think it, so too. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, how do we get there? I'm sorry. Yes. No, um, we were talking about uh, certain like favorite songs yes, or, or songs that really gra right. grab me. And I was thinking about a top 10 that I try to keep consistent. Um, so uh, one of them that comes to mind is, is Bold as Love, the Hendrix song. I just love that song so much. And there's a part of that guitar. I mean, there's obviously a lot of guitar going on in that yeah. song, but there's uh, the guitar solo toward the end. There's like a 13 second moment where I yeah. think it, <laughs> I tell people, I mean, my friends and we're talking like that contains everything you need to know about life. It's like right in that solo, it just communicates solo there because there's a lot of joy. And I just think it's like the perfect um, expression of, of notes there. So that's one of my favorite um and other songs like every grain of sand is probably by bob dylan's one of my top 10 um well i like so much of his catalog but i think that that song is just really great um really nice what else uh surfs up by the beach boys is probably in there too um and yeah a lot, a lot of bruce springsteen's whole albums um i would say donald fagan's nightfly album from 82 is in there i can't choose a song because it's more of an album experience i think but i just love that that record i just love there's a lot of like i'm lester the night fly hello baton rouge yeah. you know, it's so cool i love that oh it's such God. a great song um and it's a um like a nostal nostalgia album which i like too when someone does a work about their their youth or childhood oh yeah well you know it's funny you mentioned 82 that is when just and you'd also mentioned steve miller and yeah, and yeah. and America, and that's when Abracadabra and um, uh, you could do magic. I think we're out the same year, if I'm not mistaken. It, and that are similar kinds of songs within right. both of those are career too, where there were more of these rock people, but those particular songs definitely have this '80s pop sound, um, and both great and and both hit singles, I, I believe. So tell me, tell me what it what it was like. Um, did you feel a certain, I know writers put a lot of pressure on themselves, especially when they're given a responsibility. Um, you know, you seem very diligent and, and approach <laughs> everything with, with the utmost seriousness, but no, no one knows what it's like when you're having a meltdown at like <laughs> in the morning. I've never had those. Good, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, do you, uh, in describing the process, how did you how did you approach it? How did you go about doing it? And what was the most uh, gratifying? Um, that's a great question. I, I would have to say I, I think the interviewing experiences with me um, and Jerry and, and Dewey, which we did over about um, a year and a half, and I got to interview them about everything, pretty much all of their um, their entire careers every album and then some of their their personal lives and experiences and most of that was done over the phone because they were and usually are always on the road um a couple the first couple were done in person when they were here in new york which was nice um but that was so exciting for me again um and I'm, when you you would know that i mean if you when you get to interview people you really like it's very exciting and very very rewarding just to get to meet them um but that was so much fun and then um, on that same note, I guess it would say some of the writing, um, while that was ultimately very rewarding, some of it was, you know, challenging in terms of it was the longest work that I had ever written. And now I imagine I'm, I'm trying to get a second book going and that already seems easier to me just because, you know, once you do something once, you, you save so much time when you do it a second time because a lot of the things you had to learn by experience, you, you know now. Um, but so that was just, it was just a big undertaking in terms of considering someone's 50 year experience. Um, but because of that too, it was so rewarding. Um, and I feel like sometimes when you write about someone or an experience and when you write about a long journey like that, you, you get to live it as well. Um, sure. So I felt like I, <laughs> I had also gone on that same journey in, in a way that the band had gone on, which was really cool. Um, but yeah, it was a wonderful experience overall. And I was so fortunate, and I, I think about this even today, um, to, to have the, the backup uh, of the band in terms of that they were on board. Um, and I was even more fortunate, I wanted to tell this to you too, because it's an interesting part of the story that they didn't read any of what I was writing until, um, One, you know. What, don't go anywhere, one second. My, <laughs> my daughter's getting that locked out. What's wrong? What?
All right, she's gone. Oh, <laughs> God. My mother picked her up. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> well done. Where, <laughs> where, back up just a little bit, because now I could, uh, whatever. Uh, so you were talking about that you had the backing of the band. Yeah, and just that was so um, motivating and exciting, but also um, they didn't really read any of what I had written until I had a full draft, really. They didn't, we didn't do it, um, you know, I mean, we were interviewing the whole time, but they didn't read anything. So I was, that was a big moment for me when I had finally had to turn over <laughs> the book to them, you know, the draft, and just to, to get their reaction. And they responded so well and so positively, which was so exciting for me too, because as I said before, I think a lot of them, the song analyses are my own um, takes and opinions, and, and they definitely could have you know, decided not to, you know, take an issue with, with some of them just to, because they're more of my, my opinions, but they, they really communicated right away that, that it was on target with how they viewed themselves as well, um, and brought new insight into it too, I like to think, um, to their music and, and lives and stuff, but I, yeah, that was a great moment when, when they, they loved it, you know, after reading it, and then we edited it a bit together, which was nice, where they helped me with, um, or just clarified a couple things, to have that fact checker of, of the people who really, were there and it's their lives and, and that was nice too because I imagine writing a biography about a, a person who's been dead like 500 years is you can't do that um so it was nice to have the artist you know working with with me in, in that way it, that is exciting what and, and I'm sure the music becomes even better in your ear because you know you genuinely love these guys you know and yeah it's just it, nothing deeper than as a, as, as a fan, but it's still, you have those moments of, I mean, they're pinch me moments, you yeah, know? Right. Uh, did you have any of those, tell me what any, if there are any good stories about approaching other people that were associated with them and they just did not expect a call, but they were completely psyched to do it. Um, I think, well, also to go on with that, I was fortunate to have the band's cooperation. Um, all of the people I'm thinking, I think every single person I interviewed for um, for this book, I was introduced to by Jerry and Dewey. So they kind of, you know, explained to their, uh, and these guys are their, their friends, you know, their bandmates and stuff. Um, and some people they've worked with over the years, like Jimmy Webb um, and uh, managers and stuff. Um, but I had that that intro in, which was was very nice. Where I, I explained a bit of my approach to to each person, but it didn't I didn't have to convince anybody um, once I had convinced the band, you know. Um, but so that that was great. But th that those were some fun moments of getting to interview their their buddies and and their bandmates who were really there with, at different points in their career. And what was funny is that when I would interview people from different points of their career, for example, like a producer they worked with in the in the nineties, I believe it was um, Phil. Galston, um, and then comparing his, you know, interpretation of them and experience with them to someone who met them so young, like uh, Dan Peake's brother, uh, David, and, and having them say a similar thing about the character of the band, um, and I have it at the beginning as they're such nice guys, it's it's kind of a, a wink of, of a quote, but literally everyone said that who I spoke to, um, and it was consistent, like, like I said, at different points in their career, which... Um, matched what I had believed them, the band, to be. Um, but it was nice to, to see that arc. Um, tell me how long, um, they didn't have to wait too long until opportunities started rolling in. Uh, if, if, could you just give a brief background for those who really don't know much about America? They might know the songs, but you know, what makes their, their, um, their debut kind of, what, what makes it extraordinary? Sure. Um, well, they were Air Force kids, so they were raised um, by moving around a lot. They, they lived in different parts of the world and, and um, the U.S. and then Britain at different points. Um, and so they were never in one place for more than a year or a couple of years, pretty much. So they were used to that. Um, but they all happened to be the three uh, band members, Jerry, Dewey and Dan, happened to be in London at the same time at the tail end of the 60s in high school. Um, so that's where they all met um, and like like you said once they got once they really decided to focus on being a, a trio uh, after high school graduation um, they uh, made it 
to that crazy level of success pretty quick. Um, and it was really based around, they started, they got a manager, they worked with a producer, they got to record a first album with Warner Brothers. Um, but they, the, the success of course, that it was so massive and that it hit so many different countries um, and, and went to number one so quickly and became this huge song for so many people um, that let them hit that level of fame like you said initially, um, which yeah. most, so many artists have to, you know, after 10 years on the road, they finally had a hit or something, but mm -hmm. theirs happened right off the bat, which is an interesting experience in itself, I, I learned. Is it, are, were they grateful? Were, these guys kind of show gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think they were grateful, um, but what I thought was interesting too in, in that, that's the the story of their initial success is what every young you know rock band rock star wants to happen that's how it's supposed to go in a way where you you get success quickly your first album's a success your first single and it happened that way for them and they kind of took it as part and parcel i, I believe when they were younger it's like oh this is working out this is how it's supposed to happen and then after having a decades-long uh career in the industry i think they just appreciated it even more to to an in, intense way just to see how how that's a rare way for for success for, for just a musical career to happen so they're very grateful as you say what i'm always mindful of when certain eras and and new ones began and you know and so on and so on but I, one of the things I, I had to ask you was um, how uh, the music, everything was like the big business that surrounded the music industry in those early days, I find fascinating because they were commodifying like these really lovely songs, like spiritual with spiritual, you know, aspirations from, you know, the artist and, young wide-eyed people who really thought they could probably change the world and they mm -hmm. did to an extent but how would you describe you know the whole in the record environment and the uh record recording industry versus now which is all very much uh, a different beast in itself it is so different now um you're right, especially with um, the digital music surge and now streaming services like like Spotify that almost everyone uses, and just how money is distributed to artists that way. Mm -hmm. It's so different from from when you could only really hear someone's music by going to see them live or buying the the record album. Um, I think too, what's changed a lot is is the focus on record companies, where pretty much in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you needed a record contract to make records and so often, and I think usually those um, deals would be multi-album deals. So you would sign on for like a seven album deal, deal or a five album deal or something. And that kind of put longevity into the into the recording part of the act anyway. Um, and that's pretty much gone now or on, on the whole. Um, and so that long-term feeling, I believe doesn't exist so much nowadays, um, that like long, emphasis on, on longevity like I said um, but I think too um, the I got the sense from hearing different stories about how America worked with with people in the recording studio and they had the good fortune too to work with um, Beatles producer George Martin for so many albums and years and that was such a wonderful and fruitful partnership um, I got the feeling that everyone it, it was more or less a positive environment and a positive experience where people wanted to work together to just have a successful piece of piece of work. And it was more of a, the, not that it was more of a business experience, but there, there was more of a business element applied to it, not from the artist's perspective necessarily, but, but that big business thing was there in, in a good way at first, I would imagine. And then there are some negative outcomes of that too, in terms of when there's a corporation involved. And I think in the eighties, in the everything all over just got more corporate from my perspective anyone that the feeling everything feels from that time more you know corporate and then with um the digital not digital but like um extra technology that was coming in those classic 80s sounds like drum machines uh, and it sounds more mechanical and shiny but magic didn't i don't think they had that kind of there was probably just a little bit but it was early enough where you could still hear a full band you know yeah you hear the the instrumentation in there definitely do you ever do you ever have a, a checklist in your mind where you're thinking, okay, well, in doing this book, 
or in writing this book and researching, I'm going to learn more about X, X, and X. Like, I don't, I want to get a better idea about what the recording industry was like in those early days. And when the, before the lunatics like kind of took over the asylum. <laughs> or do, um, I mean, just what goes through your mind? Because you seem very methodical in a good way. Thank you. Um, I, I kind of didn't, I mean, I thought about that and was very aware of the historical attachments to, to this uh, classic band like this and their, their 50 year career and, and, and so much attached to that. And, and just the, the respect that goes along with having a, a long uh, career noted with many accolades, hits and awards and that kind of thing. And just the, the reputation of having these nice characters too in the industry. Um, but I really do focus more when I went and write anyway on the on the art, like the records, the songs. That's I, I spend so much time uh, thinking about that and and just kind of riffing on that um, and and what that could mean, and connected to the the artist's personal life, but also just what was going on at the time in culture and stuff. Um, so I don't I didn't think ahead too much about like that, um, like you said, having a goal of learning mm -hmm. a particular. Element. But of course, inadvertently, I, I, I did. And I, I always assume I'll learn something by undertaking anything. Um, and also to note, it was my first um, nonfiction book project. So um, I don't have anything to, to compare it to other than the, the fiction series that I wrote and shorter nonfiction works that I've done. But this was you, the you know, first trip. What do you prefer writing now that you've done both? Um, that's Yeah, that's a good question to consider. They're so different. You don't have to I, answer. Not, <laughs> <laughs> next question. Right, um, right, right. I think, in some ways, fiction is so much more free, free because there's no fact checking, or you know, you don't doesn't have to be right. You could just write whatever you want, um, right. in a way. And then, of course, with something nonfiction and a biography, there's a lot of fact checking, understandably, that that goes into that. Um, so it just felt like a more serious project that way, in comparison to the. I, I wrote a, a young adult series, and that was just very, you know freeing and, and, and fun, um, but smaller, definitely. That was nice, that's what uh, another nice part of this project was it felt like a big project and that it, it um, could theoretically affect a lot of people, all the band's fans. It felt mm -hmm. like just a bigger scope that I was working in. Do you, do you think that, um, well, let me, let me rephrase it. You know, it's fun. I was just thinking of uh, Lester Banks. Yeah. And yeah. And I listened to an interview recently. I never read Jim DeRogatis's book, but I, I heard it's fantastic, and and I really want to I want to read it because I find Lester Banks a fascinating guy, um, mm -hmm. yet just a sad guy too. You know, it, it's yeah. you could only deconstruct the world so much before I think you're just a malcontent, and I think that you could only derive so much joy out of doing you know to, to seeing the world in a almost at least the rock world in a jaundiced kind of way but I, I love he, I love his opinions and I would have only hoped that you know had he lived he might have softened up in some areas and maybe liked a James Taylor record or <laughs> or something like that but um at the same time I you kind of remind me of 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 the a composite of people and in, in almost famous is that you really do feel this music deeply. I mean, it, and, and that's, that's a really beautiful way to go. Do you think in terms of, uh, you know, where it takes you first and foremost before concentrating on, uh, you know, if this was recorded, you know, in studio two of some recording studio in midtown Manhattan, like what, what uh, what's usually the process? Just deep emotional connection. Yeah, I, I guess I, I would say that. Um, thank you, for, first of all. Um, for what? I, what did I say? The, <laughs> well, the the almost. Uh, oh yeah, famous. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't give you um, <laughs> the that the younger writer, the main character in that, the Cameron Crowe guy, um, William. I think his name is. Yeah, guy. William. William. <laughs> William Miller. Um, William Miller, yeah, yeah. straight up. Um, I always related to him, and I guess any music writer could, of course, but just him being the younger person in the room for, for all that movie, pretty much, and, and liking music that was, um, you know, a bit older older than him, and being in an older world, 
I always felt like that. And I still feel like that where, um, you know, just either talking to these older rockers or, or going to different rock shows. Because up until recently, the pandemic year, of course, I had been going to so many rock shows in New York City, pretty much all the big acts come. And a lot of times I would just go to see older acts, um, like the Steve Miller Band or Peter Frampton or something, and I would be the young, <laughs> youngest person. Um, but they there. all sound amazing. They I, all yeah. sound great, great. It um, blows my mind. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to be like a young, destroyed, you know, <laughs> rock star. I mean, these guys, Steve Miller sounds just as good now as ever, and Peter Frampton, I mean, he's Peter Frampton. Yeah, he's great. Um, definitely there, and, and to be fair too, it's not like, I mean, you do see younger people and people taking their kids, um, which is great to introduce um, them to that older music. And I relate to that too, because I, I went through that also. Um, when your parents took you to see shows? Yeah, all, always. Um, we still, we had been going to shows together too up until recently, because um, they're just always, always going to concerts, um, just because they love the music, you know? And, and like I said, New York gets the, a lot of the best acts, which is nice. Um, well, who were some of the shows that they took you to as a kid? As a kid, I'm trying to think. Um, well, they took me to see uh, Bruce Springsteen when I was in, I guess I was older by that point. I was probably in college, but we went to see, um, he was doing these album shows at the Garden here in New York City, yeah. Madison Square Garden. And we saw the an entire performance of um, the Wild, the Innocent, the E Street Shuffle, which is now one of my favorite records of all time. And getting to hear an album, um, straight through like that live was so exciting. Um, so that was a big moment for me, I remember that. Um, and then in contrast though, like an act like Steely Dan, who I love, and I love Donald Fagan and his work so much. Um, they were never huge fans of, of them. I was the one who was like, we have to go see this. <laughs> have you guys heard about this band? They're like, well, yes, of course, we have the record in the closet. <laughs> we were there when it came out. I'm sorry. Have you interviewed know. Donald Fagan? Um, I did, but it was like a group interview and it was over the, um, phone. I did get to ask him though like, a question or two, which was really exciting for me. Um, but I, you know, the in-person interview is always more fun or just the, the visual uh, interview thing. Sure. What's, what's your favorite Steely Dan tune? Oh, that's tough. Um, I really like the Gaucho record. Um, I'm trying to think if I could pick out a, a song off of there. Um, my rival, I really like. I've been getting into that song lately and just analyzing the, the horn section that, that's going on there. It's so great. Um, a glamour profession. Mm -hmm. And um, it just seems like such an LA record to me from, yeah. from that time. Very slick and, and glossy. And, and just a bard? Are you a bard person? A bard girl? No, I went to NYU actually. Okay, okay. Because Yeah, that's their school. Yeah. That's that's wild. So tell me tell me how the band, I mean, I could listen. I, I think I'm going to have you on like once every three weeks because, oh, great. because I just like, I, I, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. And I'm always curious about, you know, every time I come to New York and it's been about a year or maybe a little longer, but I'm always mindful of like, wow, this is recorded here. Or, or this is, uh, you know, that, that, that used to be CBGBs, you know, that was all yeah. this stuff. And, and um, do you, do you, do you feel that way when you walk around your your own city? Yeah, I, I had definitely. Um, and and then even beyond like rock history, there's there's the cultural history and art art history that's here. Um, and now I've been noticing like there's definitely more uh, plaques around like with certain. I keep noticing um, these certain townhouses with um, different stories about who lived there. Like landmarks. Plaques. Yeah, right. Like landmarks. Um, I just the other day. Um, I passed by, I think it was Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin's townhouse in, in Midtown. <laughs> this is cool, you know, um, like that, that stuff is really fun. And then I think because my, my parents are big rock people, um, they would point out certain sort of spots. Like my dad always points out um, Buddy Holly's apartment building on downtown um, on Fifth, Fifth Avenue in the village, which is cool. And, and Bob Dylan's house for a while was in that uh, on McDougal Street, I think, around there. Um, so yeah, I love thinking about that stuff, and it feels more alive that way when, when you're considering the the backstory of certain recordings or artists. Yeah. Now, what did your were either of your parents gigging musicians? Did they play in clubs or things like that? No. Um, my mom made a couple of um, recordings, um, and she always, you know, works on stuff here, um, and she plays piano and and 
and guitar and stuff. Um, mm. But it, yeah, I don't think she was too much of a, a gigger. Um, but once the pandemic ends, everything's, you know, who knows? Um, Do you play anything? Are you a musician? Yeah, yes. Um, I actually studied um, classical voice in, in high school. I went to an arts high school here in New York, LaGuardia okay. High School of Performing oh. Arts. Um, I was a voice major, so I went through all that training, which was really great. Um, I, I studied classical and I got into the jazz uh, stuff for a while. So I love jazz vocalists um, and I like to work on that on my own here oh, too. Cool. Um, yeah, and I was in this chorus, the Young People's Chorus of New York for, for like seven years. And wow. that was probably my whole social life, fun, funnily enough, um, where there were three three rehearsals a week. We had like 40 concerts a year um, and we got to travel together. We played all the major halls in New York and, and we played in Japan. We got to tour um, and we represented the U.S. in this choral festival there. And we went to England. That was a lot of lot of fun. That whole, and just a great musical education in conjunction with, you know, the... Um, Right. The rock studying I was doing on, on my own and, and with my family and stuff. That's really interesting. So, uh, it, you know, my, my very good friend directed the, um, the Chicago documentary. Oh, was, I uh, saw that. That's great. Very yeah. Cool. And we talk all the time. He's, he, I, I actually interviewed him about this just a few days ago, but I'll, I'll post his uh, video. I think when they're releasing something in January or February or something, but I, we were talking about that because um, it's amazing how musical these guys were. They could read charts. Yes, they could. But and then they had that grit. And and Terry Kath was just he, that guy is tr tragically unsung. You know, that's true. It, yes, but man, I mean that's a little. I don't think people know who he is. But um, so that must have been fascinating. So you're I I kind of want to meet your parents now. You know, <laughs> you, they, yeah, they're they're great. You should. They must be really proud of you. And I think that what you accomplished was, uh, I would call it Herculean, because it's really you were pretty. You could go, you could get granular, you know, with information. And I think that that's the gift that keeps giving, because you could never, you know, learn enough about something. And yeah. what was once you guys edited and everything, you know what. Uh, what was how did the how did the band react to it? Um, they were, you know, very excited and and still still are, I think, um, because this is still their their fiftieth anniversary year. That was, you know, we targeted the book to be released then and to go along with the celebration, like they they were on a, or planning to do this huge, you know, fiftieth uh, anniversary tour. I think they're just going to try to get it going again ne next year when when everything gets hopefully back to normal. Um, but I think, you know, they were, and I love hearing, it's so nice for me too, if I get to, they always do a lot of interviews and stuff, but if they mention a part of the um, the book in, in there, that's, that, that I get a kick out of that. Um, like in a recent interview that, that Dewey did, I think for, um, I think it was the Aquarian uh, online magazine, but he just mentioned how he was getting a lot of um, calls and stuff from certain friends and, and family who had read the book that didn't, you know, hadn't thought of a certain song in a while. It wasn't one of their hits and, and the book right. analyzes that song. And so it kind of brings to light certain um, great aspects of their career that deserve to be sung like that. Um, mm. So I'm glad I got to do that written down that hopefully will just you know, last for, for an articulation of the group's history. Um, but yeah, that was such a thrill for me when they, they were really excited to see how the book came out and, and they were really happy with it, which was really nice for me. Um, yeah, that's just one of the, it's a great perk and that we're friends is really great. We're friends and stay in touch. That's a nice part of this experience too. Um, I would imagine. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. What about Billy Bob Thornton? How does he fit into this picture? <laughs> that's, that, I was shocked when I saw that. Me too. I'm Well, when I first heard that that was who we were, you know, when that was de decided, it was surprising, but then it made sense, uh, of course, um, because they are friends and they have been for a while and he's such a music guy a musician and a music fan um and he's like in warren one of the warren devon books i think it was the one that his wife wrote yeah. um there's a part about how he they live next door yeah. and they both they kind of bonded by they both had ocd elements going on which is interesting um but yeah that dewey and jerry kind of thought that he would be a great person to write a forward like this just I, I think it's a lot of people re recognize him um and he's such a great storyteller um 
so I was excited to, to read that, that forward and it's such a nice way into to my intro and the book, I think. But that was another exciting part of this whole thing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're close friends, so. That's so great. He's, yeah. yeah, he was friends with Lee Von Helm as well. Oh, cool, right, and, your, um, your book. Yeah, well, yeah, so, well, I, knock on wood, I'll have lots of questions. I'm not writing about Levon. I'm writing. I'm writing with his his wife, uh, right. Sandy, about her her uh, love affair and nice long marriage with Levon until. That's great. Really How is that going for you? Is it fun? She's just yeah. the best. I love her. Uh, right. What? Um, but he. You know, but but Billy was already a fan of their. They knew him, right? Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't just a random get. What? Right. Tell me. Tell me. Um, Oh, this is a lot. I just, I always loved his interview on, on the Canadian show when he, did you ever see that? When yeah, he, I did. it was like, he, he got, he was on tour with his box cutters, uh, box makers or whatever they were called. And they were in Canada and this one, um, this one Canadian uh, great television personality is now since, been me too out of existence and rightfully so but i forgot the guy's name um it was he had mentioned he had told billy that he wouldn't mention the acting beforehand um and during the interview he did and 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 bob, billy bob thornton just completely gives him the hi-hat it, it's just one of those great it's kind of cringeworthy but yeah. it's he's so funny and so cool. So uh, what's next on the, what, what do you wanna, who do you wanna write about next? Um, I, I've been thinking about this. I had a couple of projects this past year that were in early talks, but then didn't really um, get off the ground, which happens. Um, I lately I've been focusing on potentially writing about um, younger artists, new, newer artists and, you know, and who are maybe in their 30s, 40s now, um, and and analyzing some of their work and, and how it's inspired by it, potentially um, these older rock acts that I like, um, and just highlighting that connection between, you know, the the music historical line, um, but yeah. just maybe right um, giving more attention to some some younger people um, like Mayor Hawthorne. I'm a big fan of his work, and and he's very influenced aesthetically. Anyway, I can tell by by the 70s and some 80s music um, and just kind of trying to trace trace that line. I thought about trying to, you know, get that book going. It's going okay so far, so hopefully. Good. I, I, I really I admire your your passion for this stuff. I, I because Thank sometimes you. I feel like I'm alone. You know, just you're not. <laughs> we're just that you know, I don't know. I, I always think in terms of historical context, you know, when listening mm -hmm. to anything. And I was born in 1970. So the first stuff you know, first songs I heard on the radio were these America songs. They were just always like this ubiquitous thing mm -hmm. until, you know, I'm 12 and in sixth grade and feeling awkward as hell and, you know, listening, to, you know, to You Can Do Magic, you know, but I'm like that with everything. And uh, so, yeah, anything you, anything you write, uh, I look forward to reading. Thank you so much. You're it's so, so great to hear that. So let's, uh, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk again, you know, I'm okay. sure. And, um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. So, do you have a copy of the book so you could hold it up? I know it sounds kind of cheesy, sure. but. No, no. I, I like this. I like it. The medium is the message here. Yes. <laughs> okay. It America is. the van. It's, nice cover. it's, it's light beautiful. blue. <laughs> All right. Don't go anywhere. I'll, hang on one second. 